Good evening, folks. We're going to get things started here. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Joint Town Council School Board Town Hall here at the Homer Auditorium at Scarborough High School. I'll be a moderator tonight. I'm Kevin Freeman. I live out on off of Broad Turn Road over in East Buxton. Excuse me, that is a part of Scarborough, but it's referred to as East Buxton <laughs> by some of my neighbors east of Route 1. Um, I'll be a moderator this evening for this uh, conversation that we're going to be having, this discussion about the uh, municipal budget and the proposed school board budget. Um, just as we start off, uh, a few ground rules. Um, I'll be the moderator, and, and we're going to allow about three minutes for people to answer questions, and uh, we will be uh, reading questions that were submitted. We got about 50 of them uh, from about 22 people from around town. Uh, we are hoping that we will have enough time uh, at the end to take questions uh, from you directly uh, with a cordless mic that we'll have. Uh, we also are suggesting you, if you'd like, write down questions. We've already received one, and uh, we'll try to ask them as well, as time allows. The purpose of tonight is really to address some themes, have a nice transparent discussion about the important topics of, of both budgets. Uh, we're going to try to uh, cover multiple topics of interest, we're going to try to avoid redundancy and repetition. And um, we do ask that you be civil in uh, modeling the democratic process that we're, that we're having here tonight. <clears throat> On the stage with me, we have from the town, our town manager, Tom Hall, um, the, finan the finance manager, business manager for the town, Ruth Porter. Also, uh, Town Councilman and Finance Committee Chair, Sean Babine. From the School Board, uh, from the School Department, we have School Superintendent George Entwistle, our Chair of the Board of Education, Donna Bealey. We also have the Finance Committee Chair, School Board Member Chris Cayazzo, and the Business Manager for the School Department, Kate Bolton. We uh, may have uh, Town Council Chairwoman uh, Jessica Holbrook joining us as well, but she is uh, not here as yet. We also have uh, both school department and town department heads here to answer any questions that may be specifically about their operations and, and their portion of the budget. We have had <clears throat> already some questions about the whole meeting format and the budget process itself, and we'd like to uh, address those um, after we have our presentations of the town budget overview, which will be done by Sean Babine, and the school budget overview, which will be done by Chris Cayazzo. So again, um, if any questions come up while you're uh, hearing the uh, the presentations, write them down. Karen Martin from SEDCO is in the front row, and you can bring your question, a written question, to her, or if you'd like to wait until the, uh, the end and have a chance to ask it yourself, that option is there, but I will let you know we will be stopping at 9 p.m. So without further ado, I will have Sean Babine from the Town Council do a presentation on the town budget. Thank you, Kevin. Um, welcome, everybody. Really appreciate the turnout and the questions that we've received. And I can speak for most of the councils. We've also received several emails. Um, and hopefully tonight will reflect um, a culmination of all the information that's been asked of us. Um, for the town side of the budget, um, back when we first were elected and, and transitioned to the new council in November, the town council sat down and set its goals for the current year. The goals that, are applicable, uh, that apply to our budget cycle um, are maintaining the essential services that this town has come uh, to be accustomed to, 
We wanted to avoid layoffs, recognize the fiscal constraints that are posed to us by the state's budget as well as by the county budget, um, and there's some significant constraints there. Um, we also wanted to have trade-off conversations about the services that we are providing and how we provide those. Um, with an underlining tone that we wanted to make sure that we provided a stable tax rate that we can all live with. We wanted to consider non-property tax revenues um, and where they may com come from. Uh, most of you probably heard about the original proposal as uh, pay as you throw trash bag program. That will be touched upon here um, in a little bit. And then we also wanted to look at capital and long-term planning. And um, that's really the goal of the Finance Committee is that we want to start planning out more than just simply a one-year reaction to each of the budget cycles that we are faced with. This year, we have total gross appropriations um, of $78,878,998. Um, as you can see um, by the breakdown, now again, this is total appropriations and uh, total costs. This is not net of revenues. Um, and that is a 4.74% increase over the prior year. Um, a little later, I'll show you what the, net uh, what the net impact of the budget proposal currently is, and that is a changing dynamic because of uh, different information that comes in as we go through that budget cycle. And as you can see, it's, it's fairly balanced in the sense that it's anywhere from 5 to 6 percent. I, I round numbers, um, but it's, uh, you know, I should say, 4 to, four to 6 percent. Um, schools um, are at 45.8 million. The town is at 30.6 million, and our county government is 2.5. And um, while it's not going to be a focus of our biggest conversation this evening, this county budget is actually something that we should be looking at into the future because as the governor makes his proposals, we're actually looking at next year at a 13.5% increase in the county budget as a result of um, increased jail costs that are being allocated at the county level away from the state. And we're going to have a significant impact at Scarborough as one of uh, the larger communities. Um, the town budget drivers, um, and this, by the way, the, my presentation is net of everything related to education. So I'm looking at um, municipal services, uh, fire, police, um, EMS, public works, library, SEDCO, um, all of the other services except for education. Um, of course, we have uh, many employees. We have payment plans and contractual obligations related to that. Um, we also looked at dispatch personnel um, and moving them into full year positions. Um, we had a really bad winter. Um, we're planning we have to rebuild the winter stock um, of uh, salt and sand as a result of this uh, past winter. Health insurance costs are always going up and we're impacted by that as well. And then debt service, and a significant portion of that debt service was actually approved by the voters of Scarborough that related to Wentworth. Um, the decreasing aspects that we're looking at are shared services for assessing. This past uh, council meeting, the town council approved sharing our uh, town assessor with the town of Cape Elizabeth that we saw our net reduction in our costs as a result of that. And then um, the most significant piece, even though this is related to schools, but it, it does have an impact, is the decrease in state funding. Although we did receive good news this evening at our uh, finance committee meeting, which shared service, uh, sorry, municipal revenue sharing is actually projected to go up slightly this year, uh, but it's something that we are focusing in on um, for the next couple years. The bigger piece is really the town expenditure overview. Um, again, this is uh, not including uh, education, and the largest uh, portion of our budget is public safety. Um, it is a 32.6% uh, increase. It's a 9.9 .9 or $10 million total budget. The next is public works at $6.7 million. And then our third is general government. The general government category here is really about town administration um, and other services. And then uh, public services, um, I believe that is... Um, Tom, if I'm correct, that's SEDCO, the library. Community services. Community services department is, our, is that last category. And then, of course, we have our debt. Um, while this is extremely small lettering, I'm not going to go through the details, what we really are focusing in on in this chart is really where is our timeline revenues, and the biggest portion is property tax. Um, it is the blue portion. It's at $60.8 million is generated from property tax to cover our town budget. Um, and then one of the aspects that we did include in our budget process um, this year, because we did reformulate how the manager presented the budget to us so that we could understand the programs and services um, more qualitatively, is um, what is not included in this budget. And it's a significant gap for us, and it really relates to our fire safety. Um, there are a total of nine personnel proposed uh, positions. Four of those were related to fire safety. Um, and two of those were related to our police department for new uh, police officers. 
and the others were related more to administration regarding a purchasing agent, um, a budget analyst, and there was a third position, uh, a community outreach person uh, related to shoreline and piping plovers, I believe it was. <coughs> Um, the purpose of this chart is really, I wanted to show why it's significant for us because it's something that we're going to need to deal with and I do believe that it, um, we're going to have a more complete conversation on the town council side is regarding fire services because as you can see by the charts that have been provided by our fire chief, the calls for services are increasing dramatically and the number of people responding for our fire services is decreasing. And as this community grows, um, public safety is um, number two or number one, depending on how we look at that, to education as the value of what uh, we provide in our services. Last, I just wanted to mention, um, I'm going to go back to the other slide because that's the closing. I have this in the wrong order, so I apologize. Um, so I mentioned about the gross appropriation. So the real impact that people are concerned with is what does that mean to my tax bill? The $60.2 million that is being asked um, to be raised from property tax revenue equates to a 7.74% increase, and um, that's approximately $1.10. Um, and it will go, I'm sorry, $1.10 increase, it, and the average on a residential value of about 300000 which is what Scarborough's average value is, is about $331. I do want to mention, this is actually a moving number, and the reason is that as the manager and the superintendent um, and their staff um, get better information and are able to solidify the revenue sharing from the state, the schools, um, you know, the GPA and what the final numbers are from them as well as our other expenses that we either put out to bid or finally get the uh, prices on and the decisions that we make as a town council impact the bottom line. I can tell you that based on adjustments that have been presented to us by the superintendent and by the manager, that number at least as of today based on the decisions that we made today is actually 7.12%. Um, that is before we actually have a more complete conversation around education in Scarborough that will happen next, um, next Monday. And I did want to mention the schedule that we're going to adopt um, going forward from tonight after the Q&A tonight. We will have our public hearing um, on May 6th at the Town Council Chambers at 7 o'clock. Um, we will have a joint budget workshop on May 13th between the school board and the Town Council. That is a uh, full workshop. On May 20th is the second reading, um, second and final reading and adoption by the town council. Then that's when the school board budget will go out to vote, which is a state requirement. Um, and that will go, should go out by June 9th. Um, it's a very tight schedule that we're following. A lot of it is dictated really by the necessity to have that public vote um, because um, in the past couple of years we've had to go through that voting process a couple of times. So we want to make sure that we have enough time to implement the budget uh, based upon the um, town council's uh, direction as well as the citizens' um, direction in their vote. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris for the school. Thank you, Sean. <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, first of all, I'd like to also say thank you very much for coming. This is, uh, I guess, unprecedented in modern times for us to have the opportunity to address questions directly and uh, hopefully this is a positive and a successful experience that we can continue to build on moving forward. Um, I did want to start with our budget objectives. It's a slightly different than what the council is typically used to. Um, when it comes to defining the school board's budget objectives, uh, it's really important to remind ourselves what the primary function of the school board is. This can be articulated um, basically in the first operating protocol that we follow, and that is the children's interests come first. The board will represent the needs and the interests of every child in our district. We'll stay flexible, endeavor to meet the needs of every student, advocate for adequate and appropriate resources, and remain willing to examine how we might do our job better. And that's verbatim what our primary objective is. This is important because it does summarize the clearly defined and separate roles that the school board and the council play in the governing of the town. Having said that, it doesn't mean that the school board is oblivious to the greater needs of the community. Each member of the school board is a taxpaying resident of Scarborough and as the finance chair I can assure you that we take great care in the definition of adequate and appropriate resources. We begin the budget process this year like we do every year we instructed the most qualified and best suited educational professional in our town, which is the superintendent, 
to develop a student-centered needs-based budget that not only takes into account the current needs of the district, but most importantly takes into consideration the long-term educational goals of our community. He works with his leadership team, who each have well-established expertise in specific areas, such as curriculum development, special education, and school finance. He also works with key building administrators who can clearly and professionally address the wide and varying needs of each student in our district from pre-K all the way up through to graduation. The budget that they develop is then presented to the school board as a first reading. While we do endeavor to, to ensure complete accuracy in our facts and figures, invariably there is information that we need from either the state or from our vendors that's either not available or still being processed at the time of the first reading. This year, for example, there's pending state legislation that could still impact the school budget in terms of teacher, requirement co uh, teacher retirement costs and charter school tuition. To be responsible in our budgeting process, we typically take a very conservative approach when predicting those impacts. In other words, we hope for the best, but we plan for the worst. That's typically why the budget presented for the first reading is higher than subsequent budget revisions. And I'll go through some of the numbers a little bit and show you how. The school budget process is very complex, um, and it's not by choice, it's by necessity, unfortunately. It requires input from many skilled and highly qualified professionals, and these experts not only understand its intricacies, but they also understand the implications of making uninformed adjustments and the impact those adjustments will have on the educational process for our students. So, it's enough for the prepared remarks. The, uh, School expenditures, we'll start off with expenditures. Uh, our base expenditure this year is 38,508, uh, which is a change of 3.73% versus last year, and that is predicated basically on many of the same driving factors in the town. We've got contractual obligations for, uh, for teachers, we've got um, costs for fuel, we've got benefit costs, those are pre-programmed in, and that's reflecting in the 3.73% change. For debt service, we have an increase this year of $341,945. That's predominantly driven by Wentworth. That's come online this year, so that will, uh, that's a number that's created um, by, the, uh, by the town and is given to us as a portion of our cost to cover that, that responsibility. The other two components are what we call discretionary components. Basically, that is education improvement plan or what we call reconciliations. So of the budget, the things that make the biggest impact on the students in terms of their performance, in terms of whether we're hiring new teachers or whether we're making improvements on programs and services is that 1%. Right now, as it stands, um, that's a little over 400,000. So that's in essence what we have for discretionary funds to work with. Anything less than that, and we have to start looking at changing and adjusting programs and the base core of where we're at this year. The other factor is revenues. Un unfortunately, unlike the town, we, we can't generate our own revenues. We can have some fees, we have some tuition uh, reimbursements for adult ed and things like that, but predominantly we have to rely on the town to provide us with the income and the state to provide us with the income to function as a, as a, as a district. This year, we're looking at a decrease of uh, $1,018,000 in general purpose aid from the state. Uh, I wish I could say that that's unique, but it's been a steady trend. Uh, we're also looking at a decrease of $350,000 in fund balance. Now, what that really means is last year our fund balance was very robust. So rather than build on that, we decided to use a, a very large portion of that to help reduce our tax burden last year. As a result, we've depleted that fund fairly significantly. So the intent here is to use less money this year to try and rebuild that fund up. In essence, it's like a rainy day fund. We also have a, a, a net increase in some of those non-tax revenues, the tuitions, reimbursements for uh, state Medicaid and a few other issues that are lumped in. But that, that's a fairly insignificant increase. It's better than a decrease, but it's not that large. Ultimately, we're looking at a net loss in non-tax revenues of 21.4% this year. Unfortunately, that's not the whole story because since 
fiscal year 09, our state subsidy has decreased 58.3%. And that's a huge number. So unfortunately, we have two choices in that situation. We can try and, and scale back the programs and, and cut services and cut programs that are already lacking, or we can ask for an increased share in the property tax value. So what are some of our cost drivers? These are the big ticket or larger ticket items that you'll see from the list we really have very little control over. Um, charter schools tuition, that's something that the state is establishing. We don't really have a say in how much that is. And we have to pay that dollar for dollar. Now, we get some reimbursement from the state for that, uh, but the reimbursement rate is typically 11 to 13 cents on the dollar that we pay out. So that's a big, that's a big chunk out of, our, out of our, our regular operating budget. Special services tuition increases, that's for students who we can accommodate in district, but by law we have to accommodate. Uh, we don't have the facilities, we have to send them to an outside facility, we have to pay a tuition for that. Main PERS is the shift from the state to the local district for stu uh, teacher retirement. So this year our local share is increasing by 193,000. 193, Workers' comp insurance, that's pretty straightforward, and then debt service. So of the total increase in expenditures this year, 938,000 of that is completely beyond what we can control. That's what we have to react to. So then we'll talk about capital improvement. That's the, the other area of our budget. There are typically three components in the capital improvement budget in any given year. There's the technology portion, the facilities portion, and the uh, transportation portion. So technology is, is typically um, what we refer to as a refresh. So we take every component or every group in the school, say K2 one year, middle school the next year, Wentworth, and we, every year we refresh their technology. We do this to try and keep our costs controllable and sustainable and predictable. So every year we try and rotate that technology through. It's about a four or five year rotation and that's generally about the right time to be switching technologies out. Uh, this year the portion of technology budget is $991,050. So that's not just for an individual facility, that's district wide. There may be some other district things uh, included in that number. Last year it was for the uh, communications telephone system that we shared with the town. So that's all encompassing for technology. The second line is the facilities budget, and that's what you th typically think it would be. Bricks and mortar, new, new HVAC, ceilings, roofs, paint, that kind of stuff. This year we're looking at a $223,000 investment for those facilities. And the last number of transportation, uh, that's $316,000 this year. Uh, we follow a very similar program that the town does in that we try and rotate our buses through on a fairly predictable level. Again, that gives us a a sustainable and predictable investment. We typically roll between two and three buses out every year. If we skip a year, then as happens with any fleet, uh, those costs for maintenance go up, and eventually when we do replace, we're looking at a much bigger capital investment. So we try and sustain that fairly consistently through the, through the budget cycle. The long and the short of it is, uh, the CIP budget this year is, is, is much lower than it has been in the previous years. In 2014, uh, we were looking at 1.7 million. To that last year, we had 1.78, and this year our total request is 1.5 million. So this last slide basically shows you the breakdown. Uh, we, the the uh, top components here are, are technology, facilities, and then transportation. So the transportation bars are relatively consistent. They're the same amount, two to three buses every year. Uh, you'll notice this year a, an increase in technology and a decrease in facilities. What's driving that is the decision this year to try and uh, implement a tech refresh for the high school. And what's involved in that tech refresh is one-to-one -one computing. So that's our largest facility, it impacts the largest number of students. So we realize that that request for funding is going to be much greater than it has been in previous years. So to try and offset that a little bit, we adjusted our facilities budget and postponed and tried to move out some of those bigger projects that we were looking at for facilities. And then ultimately, as you see, the last slide in the corner is the, is the breakdown of total budget requests for CIP. 
So that's our budget presentation, and I guess I will turn it back. Thank you, Chris. And thank you, Sean. I did. I, I was remiss at the beginning. I wanted to uh, make note of the uh, town council members that are here in attendance um, over to my left and also the uh, school board members that are here in attendance here at the Homer this evening as well. Let's get on to the questions. <coughs> we had uh, we, questions that came in on the the meeting format, the budget process, and also um, the, uh, the, you know, the municipal budget and the uh, school budget. Um, let me start right in. We had uh, th kind of three questions that, and we were trying to avoid redundancy on a lot of the questions. Um, here we go. This is from uh, Betsy Gleistein and also from an anonymous uh, questioner. Uh, why require questions in advance? Why not take questions on the fly? What is the reluctance to take questions directly from the public the way Governor LePage does in his town hall meetings? Um, well, for that very reason that I just spoke of, that we wanted to avoid redundancy, um, we also felt that with a lot of the questions, we wanted to have a, a chance to be able to answer them as fully as possible with information that uh, might not be readily available to people just speaking off the cuff. Um, <clears throat> I think in most public meetings that the governor is a part of, we do find that he has his questions asked in advance as well. The second question, why ask people to submit their contact information? Some people may want to ask questions but remain anonymous to protect their viewpoints. The council and the school board should take this opportunity to welcome all questions, no cherry picking of questions. Well, in, in, in terms, and that was from Betsy Gleistein as well, and anonymous, um, <clears throat> in a public meeting, it's standard protocol to identify yourself and where you're from. It happens in every council meeting, and that's why we're, we're asking people to identify themselves with their questions. Um, <clears throat> and again, when it comes to uh, asking the questions, we're going to ask every one of them that was, that was submitted here tonight. Number three, can the school referendum vote be expanded with specific ranges of what the voters consider to be an appropriate percentage change in the school budget? This would give the council a much better sense of where to set a future budget level prior to resubmission to the voters. Tom? I'll uh, take a stab at that question. I, I believe the, the council could choose to do that. In fact, uh, really since the advent of the school validation vote, which is a state requirement, uh, we do often, if not have always, asked the, I'll call it the Goldilocks question, too high, too low, just right. Uh, and that does provide some insight to the council as to, depending on the outcome of that school validation vote, as to what the next step is should it fail. Uh, the council could be more exact with that question, I suppose, and provide ranges, uh, but it, that would be advisory and only really to benefit uh, the council's insight, if you will, uh, again, should that vote fail. Thanks, Tom. Uh, that question, by the way, was asked by Steve Hanley. Uh, Steve Hanley uh, is also one of the people, one of three people asking a question for, uh, along with Betsy Gleistein and uh, C. Douglas Pierce. The question is, do you support holding a referendum for both the municipal budget and the school budget? If not, why not? There would be no additional costs and more citizen participation. I think we'll have Councillor Baybine answer that. Um, so that's, uh, I would consider a more individual uh, choice to answer. Um, and I'm here really representing the entire council, so I don't want to speak out of turn for them. I do believe that is a valid question to ask, and it's one that we're going to present to the full council to have it as part of the discussion regarding the entire budget. All right, question number five, uh, also asked by Steve Hanley and Anthony Palmer. How does the town council and school board factor in the ability of residents to afford tax increases? If taxpayer affordability is one of the factors used in producing the school budget, 
What standards or criteria does the council or board employ in evaluating whether the budget is affordable or not? Um, so I'm going to take a stab at that. Again, it's another question really I think that um, should be presented to the entire council and each individual member kind of present that because everyone can um, take different value with different services that are provided in the town. There are many of us that don't have children in the school system and we may say or they may say that um, educational services should not be the most significant portion of the budget. Some may have family that work um, and are part of the fire department or the police department. So um, I think that everyone looks at um, what is best for the community as a whole um, and then try to balance because what might be affordable to me may not be affordable to the neighbor, my next door neighbor, but yet could be even more than affordable for the next door neighbor to him. So it's very hard to find that out, and I think that this process that we've created together with the joint um, town council and school board uh, session, as well as having this forum, is a good way of getting that dialogue started so that we can better understand what everybody's affordability is. Thank you, Sean. Uh, Steve Hanley has another question around process. It is, uh, it is the town council's responsibility to approve the total amount of taxpayer funding of the school budget. What standards or criteria do you use to determine what the amount is? If you are approving the reasonableness of the bottom line of the school budget, does that mean that you have to understand the school budget in detail to determine what a reasonable bottom line is? Um, I'll take a shot at that too. <laughs> um, so I've, I've been fortunate enough to actually serve on both the school board and was on their finance committee uh, many years ago, but now also on the council. And I think that um, one does not necessarily need to understand every single line item within the school's budget to be able to understand what the educational needs of this community are. Um, personally, I believe that's what the seven members of the school board are elected to do for me and for everyone else. So. Um, there are pieces that I think that we need to understand, and this is the first year that we really took a deep dive into what are the cost drivers so that we could understand that. We also took a deeper dive into what are the new requests that are being asked and what was the value added for those so that we could support them um, or object to them, depending on um, an individual's uh, perspective. So I personally do not believe you need to understand every single line item within the school budget um, to be able to understand what is needed for our schools. Um, I, I rely on the school board members to be the experts who hire the experts, just as I hope that they count on the same for the town councilors and the town staff. Thank you, Sean. Uh, C. Douglas Pierce has a question on process. Why didn't the town council set aside the proposed 2016 annual budget with an associated property rate increase of 8.5% at the first reading? I'll, uh, I'll begin that, and perhaps Council Davine can chime in after me. Um, I can't speak for the Council why they did it. I can speak for the timeline and the process. Uh, this year was a bit different in that uh, Superintendent Entwistle and myself presented the budget, uh, I believe, on April 1st, and that same evening at that meeting, uh, first reading was scheduled. Uh, the town charter uh, is very specific in terms of budget adoption process and, and what happens, uh, how that's initiated. And, in short form, I guess, I am tasked as manager to propose a budget. The council has 60 days from my date of proposal to adopt that budget. And so it is important uh, to initiate the process. And I should mention that all of this must be wrapped up by the uh, end of the fiscal year, which is the end of June. So all of those factors together, um, I think, speak somewhat to the issue in terms of uh, initiating the process. And I'll uh, defer to Councilor Babine as to uh, perhaps why he voted that evening. Um, all I can suggest is that it was a five to two vote, so it wasn't a simple majority. It was actually what some might consider a super majority. Um, personally, I, you know, as chair of the finance committee, you need to have a baseline in which you start your discussion. If we start the discussion by throwing something away and not voting it on the table, how can you have the discussion? And the, the discussion around why to table it um, obviously, five members of the council felt that it wasn't a strong enough argument, and they approved it. Okay, thank you, guys. Um, Don Petron has uh, our final question about process. If the council votes down the budget later in the process, 
is the budget originally submitted by the school board at 12.8 percent adopted was the council informed by the town manager of the consequences of approving or moving along the initial budget were the five council members that voted to move the process forward correct to say that there was no significance in that vote other than to just move the process forward Again, I, I guess dovetailing or following up on my previous comment, the Charter further um, uh, delineates that whole budget adoption process. Uh, th there's multiple parts to this question. Um, in terms of me notifying them of the consequences, I, I don't want to diminish the importance of the adoption process, and there are two votes required for final adoption of any uh, significant council action budget, certainly being one of them. Uh, the first reading is of little consequence in that it's not final. It does initiate the adoption process, uh, so it is important in that regard. Um, I, again, we'll defer to Councillor Bevine to um, talk about whether he was properly uh, aware of his vote, and I did my job by making him aware of that. Uh, the final piece in terms of what happens in the event the council does not adopt the budget, the charter prescribes that and essentially should the council choose not to vote a, a budget in within 60 days of me submitting it to them, uh, the budget that I submit is the one that goes forward. That's not to say that the council would stop and not keep working. Uh, I would fully expect that they would continue their work and ultimately adopt a budget which would become the budget we live under. But until that time, we would work under the proposed budget. And part of my proposed budget includes the school's proposed budget. Um, I've got one last question that is along this same theme, and it came from someone here in the audience tonight. Um, one of the town council goals was a responsible and realistic budget. To paraphrase Gil Emilio, the ex-CEO of National Semiconductor, you cannot achieve what you cannot quantify and articulate. Please articulate your definition of a responsible and realistic budget. I'm not even going to hazard a guess at that. I would defer that. So um, I, I do want to make sure I answer the part of the question from the previous question as well, because I don't want anybody to think I'm avoiding that, so I'll go back to that. But okay. um, again, I'm here representing seven members of the town council. To define that is a personal opinion, and I don't think it's fair to my co-counselors to be able to define that because they could disagree with what I define as realistic and responsible. Um, but I'd be happy to share my personal opinion later if you want to come up and ask me. Um, back to the previous question regarding um, what was uh, it was specific around the council. Oh, if we were informed, um, I can tell you that, um, and this is by no means any slight to the town manager, in the 15 years off, uh, with a couple years off in between. The, com the town manager and even the superintendent have, um, when I was on there, um, have never told me what the um, outcome or the effect of a budget being passed. It's been my responsibility to understand that and to do the research as a counselor and even as a school board member. You, you are often tasked with doing your own research and understanding what you're engaging in in the conversation and understanding what your boundaries are. So I was very well aware of what the the town charter says, as well as what state law says about what my authority is um, relating to not only the town's budget, but even whether it's a line item authority or a total aggregate authority over the school's budget. I really believe that every counselor does their research, knew that standard um, without being told by the manager. Um, and I don't believe that by passing this, and I can tell you I did not pass that budget on the first reading because I'm hoping that um, nothing gets taken care of in between that and the second reading and then Therefore, that budget gets passed. I mean, I was elected, like everyone else, to um, be responsible and to be engaged in that process and to get the answers and to make a decision um, on your behalf. And that's part of that whole process. So, um, you know, I can tell you, and I, I think I speak for the other councillors. I don't think any councillor passed the first reading thinking that that was going to be the budget that gets approved in the end. I really don't believe anybody did that. Thank you, Sean and Tom. Let's move over now to the school department side of things, the school budget, and then we'll, we'll jump back into the town um, municipal budget here in a bit. Um, question uh, number one on the school budget, why are we losing $1 million in state GPA funding? 
Have we challenged this number? Falmouth and South Portland are seeing only modest decreases. Cape is seeing a sizable increase. Something seems off here. That question was asked by Teresa McCabe, and it's also been asked by a question by a person that has asked the same question here in writing. And I'm going to take that, Kevin. Okay, George. Uh, it does uh, indeed seem a bit off, and um, I will ask my uh, capable colleague, Kate, who's sitting right next to me, to explain um, exactly uh, what happened there. Uh, but as for challenging the number, I can certainly speak to that. Um, it's uh, the formula that is used by the Department of Education is called the Essential Programs and Services. It's called EPS. It's very complex and um, not necessarily well understood. Certain factors have um, uh, impact that seems not in proportion uh, to other factors. Uh, that being the case, um, board members and myself have gone to the, the Department of Education. Uh, we have gone to meet with legislators, um, in fact, um, but to, and that was last year and this year, uh, but to no avail. We even testified uh, again uh, both years to the negative uh, impact that the EPS formula was having on uh, Scarborough in front of the Legislative Appropriations Committee um, and as well the Education and Cultural Affairs Committee. Thank you, George. <clears throat> Kevin, I'm going to ask Kate to just hit the one, okay. one million. Absolutely. Um, just to weigh in on the, on the quantity or the, the size of that change, the EPS formula was developed by the Department of Education um, in conjunction with the legislature to figure out the best way to divvy up the pie of what they call general purpose aid, which is the funding that comes to local school districts from the state. And uh, it is, as George said, it's a little bit mysterious. Um, we think there might be one person in the state of Maine who actually understands it, the guy who wrote it. Um, but the, the variables that have impacted Scarborough negatively, um, just to put them very simply, are the fact that the valuation in the town has increased compared with the state average, and the population of the school district has either stayed flat or declined in comparison with the school average. Uh, with the state average. So what that means is when the pie is divvied out, Scarborough loses, and the impact of that loss can be very sizable because the pie is not very large. Um, if the state were able to fully fund the uh, requirement that they have to provide aid to K-12 schools in Maine, um, we wouldn't probably be having this conversation. But because the pie isn't big enough, those variations in funding are, are sizable. Okay, thank you. Um, let's move on to another question. This was posed by Philip LaRue, Jr. What is the average cost of a child attending school in Scarborough, and how does that cost compare to the cities and towns in the greater Portland area? Uh, well, there is, uh, for those who are interested on the school's website, there is a chart uh, that shows per pupil cost. These are apples to apples comparisons uh, because there's a very regimented way that um, each school is required to report their expenditures um, and uh, so people can take a look at that. Um, uh, basically, we have a peer group of cohorts um, like communities and um, we uh, uh, basically compare ourselves with those other local districts. Um, and again, it, using the State Department of Ed's uh, data, it's updated annually. The latest figures that we have, however, are from 2013, 2014, so the data lags a little bit behind, but it does show that Scarborough's per pupil spending last year was per pupil $12,312. That would place us in eighth position in the comparative group and just barely um, above the state average of $12,056 per pupil. Um, looking at the data is uh, rather interesting. There are certain components that make up that data. For example, we are significantly here in Scarborough uh, below the state average in our school and system administrative costs, and I would think that people would be happy about that. And also significantly below the state average in our transportation and facilities costs. We're more at the state average for student instruction and support 
um, which is a critical element of the spending, special education, and overall pupil spending. Um, uh, someone had asked about what is reasonable in terms of budget numbers, and I suppose I need to take some responsibility for saying that um, we have been very engaged in con conducting some very in-depth spending going back 20 years, and I think that what can best inform uh, what will happen in the future is what has happened in the past. And so we have looked closely at what has happened with Scarborough, what has happened with our cohort districts, what has happened in terms of the state average, and even a national comparison average. And um, in all of those, Scarborough um, basically um, uh, scores or uh, places as being below um, many of those like, like districts in all levels of spending. Thank you, George. Uh, Larry Hartwell uh, submitted a question, and he's looking back uh, at, at numbers as well. Larry asks, what was the actual dollar amount spent for school year 2010 and approved for the current year 2015? What is the percentage increase from 2010 to 2015? I'm going to direct that to uh, Kate here. I'm the numbers person, so I'm, I'm going to read you numbers. Um, in fiscal year 2010, we budgeted $35,094,217, and we actually spent $33,999,000. Uh, the reason that we had quite a bit left over that year was that that was the year that we actually received a restoration of curtailment. I don't know if you all remember that whole ARA thing where the um, government decided to send some money out to the states during the economic downturn, um, but we didn't spend as much as we had budgeted because we had additional funds available to us there. In fiscal 15, we have a budget of 41,990, excuse me, 41,990,624. The percent change from fiscal year 10 to fiscal year 15 in the budget is 19.7%. Uh, we don't really know what the actual expenditure change will be because we're not there uh, at year end for fiscal 15 yet, but it should track pretty closely with that budget change. There is a chart, um, I, I think tonight we'll probably talk a lot about things that are on the website for people who want to dig a little bit deeper because we're trying to get as much data up there as we can. Um, on the budget page of the school district's website, uh, there are some sort of interesting bits and pieces uh, of data. And one of those, I think, is a chart that shows the change in revenues, expenditures, and the local tax request over the past seven years. And it's quite interesting to track, interesting if you're a numbers nerd, uh, to track those changes. And you can very clearly see uh, how that uh, has impacted our town, um, the sort of general basic gradual increase in expenditures and the drastic loss of non-tax revenue and the subsequent impact on the town taxpayers. Thanks, Kate. <clears throat> We're getting a lot of questions and I'm trying to match them up with ones that we already have. Um, here's another question for the school budget and it came from Larry Hartwell. What was the actual dollar amount? Well, excuse me, I just asked that one. I'm sorry. Um, Steve Hanley uh, asked the question, how do Scarborough teachers' salaries compare to those of other local school districts? Please provide specific data on years of experience and education level to facilitate a valid comparison. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Joanne Sizemore, who's the assistant superintendent, uh, to address this. She plays a key role in the uh, negotiations um, in, in terms of the teacher's contract. Um, I think that um, the short answer is the Scarborough teachers are by no means leading the pack, um, nor are they at the bottom of the pack. They're probably uh, getting closer to the middle of the pack, which I would presume um, people would be pleased about as they are um, placed in a more competitive position um, and we're able to attract higher quality teachers to come and teach here. But I'll let Joanne speak to that. Okay. The current teacher contract was negotiated in 2012-2013. At that time, we did a review of 16 area schools and found that our teachers were in the bottom 10% for salaries. 
Therefore, the salary, the salary table negotiated was, uh, our aim was to move the teachers to the middle of that group, along with offsetting some savings in health insurance and other costs. In the year 2015-16, this will be our third year of the contract and we will begin negotiations again for next year. <clears throat> Um, a, a question that may be related to that, I'll ask it to you, George. Um, what is the average percentage raise teachers are to receive in 2015? Um, I th in terms of uh, teachers, um, I think that um, one of the things that uh, uh, we need to understand is that teacher pay, like other public uh, employees and other teachers, um, both in the state and nationwide, they're paid using a salary table that often ex, um, sort of expands over decades of time. Uh, so essentially, it is something that we call a, um, a, a salary schedule of steps. It basically allows some movement as uh, new degrees are achieved or new credentials are achieved, but it basically creates um, incremental steps that allow some movement and that's very predictable um, for the public entity that's paying these public service employees. So um, the, the uh, situation in, in Scarborough, like other districts in Maine and th throughout the country, is that we do have a salary schedule that generally stays in place. And what happens is in negotiations through the years of the contract, like this last contract, which was three years, what's negotiated with the uh, union is um, a COLA, a co or cost of, uh, of living inc adjustment or increase. And that is applied onto the salary schedule. So the pay system, this pay system, um, which has been longstanding, uh, as I said, and very widespread, it really provides an incentive for teachers um, and also other municipal and public groups of employees for ad advancing their credentials continuing their education, but just as importantly, um, staying in place and, and earning um, a, 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 an increasing wage uh, through longevity over decades of service, um, in this case, uh, teaching. So the salary table for the current contract, which is also available on the school website, shows those step changes or that salary schedule that I'm talking about, and the COLAs established for the three years of the current bargaining agreement were 1.5% increase in 2013-14, a 2% increase in 2014-15, and a 2.5% increase, which is the last year of the contract, which is this upcoming year uh, for 2015-16. Thank you, George. A um, question that I just had uh, come up to me. Uh, is also on our list, and that is, what is the average percentage raise administrators are to receive in 2015? What is the highest percentage raise being given? And how do these compare to comparable school districts uh, in the area? Okay, I'll, I'll first talk about how do they compare with comparable school districts. One of the items that I talked about in terms of per pupil cost is uh, school and administrative costs, and we are at the lowest of our um, cohort, cohort group, so we are the lowest spender in our cohort group, and we are also below the state average in our spending in that particular area. Um, administrators are not paid on, a, on the salary schedule that I just talked about. They are more typically paid. Um, we do have uh, administrators that fall into two different categories. Our principals and assistant principals have a bargaining unit agreement. Um, they are currently in negoti negotiations with the board for a new contract that um, would begin July 1, 2015. The central office administrator's contract, um, they do that individually with the board through me and with their salary and benefits package, and, and that's usually consistent with um, that that comes out of the bargaining for the uh, principals and assistant principals. So raises have not yet been determined. We're uh, still in the process of doing that. But the estimate uh, that would be a legitimate and um, uh, I'm, I'm confident that it would be between 2% and 3%. And uh, that question, which was asked by Brian Shumway, 
also asks if you would please distinguish between central administration and support administration. Um, well, central, we have um, the central office. Uh, in central office, we have central office administrators. They are individuals who um, contract with the board through me, as, as I do with the board. Um, support service staff would be more our clerical support um, in the central office. They are considered confidential employees, so they are not part of a bargaining group. So they, too, have ind um, independent <coughs> employment contracts. Other, all other, I, I believe all other uh, district employees are covered by some kind of contract. Okay, thank you, George. And just one final question on this, and then we're going to jump over to the municipal side of the budget for a little bit. Um, this is a follow-up to an earlier question about uh, per-pupil cost. Uh, the question is, my understanding is that some schools include their sports facilities, fields, debt service, and maintenance costs in the school budget, whereas Scarborough puts it into the community services budget. Is this correct? That does not sound correct to me, um, but... Um, I, Kevin, I, I, might, I might ask you to repeat that, but I, I think... Okay. What, there, there's a difference between the services that the town provides for us. We do um, leverage an enormous amount of shared services. Community services takes care of our fields. They do our facilities rentals. Um, so there are, there are a number of things that we do where we rely on community services um, to support our athletics program. But we do have our own athletics budget. So I, I guess the question is really leading to is our per pupil expenditure really accurate as compared with those of other towns? I think that's the real question. Um, and I, I think that you would find a varied number of um, models in different towns, um, you know, from <laughs> municipal districts such as Cape Elizabeth and Westbrook to RSUs or combined districts that, that take in a number of different towns. My guess would be that there's probably a good half a million dollars in talking with, with uh, Bruce Gulliver uh, of expenditures that would have had to be carried by the school department if we didn't have the services that were provided to us through community services. So that might make a little bit of a bump in those expenditures. But on the other hand, we don't really know what types of arrangements those other towns might have with their uh, community services or with um, their facilities, rentals, or or what have you. So you know, we do our best to leverage those shared services to be as efficient as we possibly can here in our town. And we trust that over the long run that those comparative numbers are actually quite accurate. Um, there's also the fact that the state has very stringent requirements on what schools report and what they don't. Um, so you, you really do have a sense that there are some apples to apples comparisons going on here. Uh, just if Tom? I could, just if I could add, the Finance Committee, Town Finance Committee met this evening just uh, an hour and a half ago, and one of the major discussion points was doing a, a, a better job and a very close look at allocating those costs better. Uh, that's a, a fairly detailed process and too detailed to do as part of this budget process, but we have committed to spending some time to understand that for purposes of allocating to make sure that the costs are properly ref reflected. And in a recent example of that, we have a, a great shared model with IT services. Uh, and we now, um, based on um, you know, looking very closely at that, have a great de degree of confidence that we're allocating the costs appropriately between town and school. We endeavor to take the same sort of approach looking at uh, facilities and grounds maintenance. Thank you, Tom. One last question, George, before we go, and it's, it's one that I've kind of got in my head, too. Liam Summers is asking it. Who is in Scarborough's cohort group? Oh. Uh, hold on. I, I could almost I rattle them here. off, but I don't know that I could do, do it right. In, co in the cohort group is uh, Yarmouth, Falmouth, MSAD 51, which is Cumberland and North Yarmouth, Cape Elizabeth, RSU 5, which is Freeport, RSU 21, Kennebunk, South Portland, Gorham, Westbrook, and RSU 14, which is Wyndham Raymond. Thank you very much, and we'll return to the, get you, let you guys have a break for a little bit, and we'll move over to the, the municipal budget. And um, I will start off with a question that was asked by Ted Hall. What happens to the overlay in the town budget? 
Just full disclosure, I'm not related to Ted Hall, so this is not a... <laughs> uh, the overlay is something that's uh, prescribed and, and provided for in Title 36. It's a state statute, and in essence, uh, the purpose it serves, uh, an overlay is an amount of money budgeted each year to pay the, uh, potentially pay any tax abatements that come forward in that year. Uh, it is a number that the assessor actually, uh, probably the final number that the assessor uh, arrives at before final commitment is made. Uh, for purposes of budget, we do estimate an overlay amount so we can estimate your potential impact on taxes, but it is uh, a function of the assessor. And again, its purpose is to provide funds to pay for tax abatements. And just uh, perhaps a little context, a tax abatement, uh, sometimes we get things wrong in the tax office. Uh, we describe a property, property improperly, and therefore we have to abate taxes or provide some rebate, if you will, back to the taxpayer. We charge them too much. That's uh, the overlay provides for that payment, if you will. And just uh, to put the amount that we have budgeted this year, it's just over $300,000 we've included in the budget. Uh, the state law allows up to 5% of that commitment value. Our commitment's about a $60 million commitment, so that would be as much as a $3 million overlay. Um, ours is just a tenth of that, and that's uh, historically served us well. In the event it's not used for abatement purposes, it becomes undesignated fund balance. Thank you, Tom. Um, a question from our audience, and I do not have a name on uh, this question, but I'd like to know in simple language that when the council agreed to the originally inflated submitted budget, does that mean if the council rejects that budget, does the proposed budget the school board submitted go into effect? Does that not make it extremely difficult to vote any budget down, <coughs> if not impossible? I think I responded uh, to the essence of that question before. Um, the council is tasked with adopting the budget. It's one of their major functions. The charter is very clear. Adopting a budget is, uh, is almost paramount in the, in the responsibility of the town council. In the event that they fail to, uh, the charter further provides that until such time they do adopt one, uh, the budget that I propose, which includes the school's budget proposal, is the one in effect. And as I mentioned earlier, I would fully expect the council not to fold its arms and not take any action. They would continue to deliberate and ultimately would have a budget adopted uh, uh, that may extend beyond uh, July 1st. Uh, I think there's probably been occasions where that's happened. And I think the charter was uh, uh, prepared in such a way to really uh, compel the council to take action, not to simply sit on a budget. Um, I suspect in many cases, and the questioner probably uh, feels this way as well, uh, where we start in the budget process is not where everyone wants to end up. And so there's a, a great deal of motivation associated with that charter provision for the council to do its job and to adopt a budget. Okay, we've got one more hour and many questions to go through. Um, considering the pay-as-you-throw program will no longer be implemented, how will the loss of $400,000 in projected revenue and the loss of approximately $139,000 in cost avoidance be accounted for? Are there other revenue streams and or expense reductions being targeted to make up for this gap? Uh, I can report that earlier this evening the council uh, scoured the, the non-property tax revenues thoroughly and uh, will be proposing a series of recommendations to the full council. Uh, two, of, uh, two revenues will be proposed for increase. One is excise tax revenues, the other being uh, some additional beach revenues. Uh, those two together are an additional $125,000 in revenue. So I think there are already efforts and there will continue to be efforts to look for additional non-property tax revenue. As was mentioned at the outset, that was one of the strategies, budget strategies uh, that the council had uh, staff has taken that to heart, and that's really one of the reasons the Page Throw program came forward. That is uh, one strategy in shifting from taxpayer support for a municipal service to a user fee system. And uh, that's really how the whole program came forward. And no one was more surprised than myself, maybe Mike Shaw, public works director, 
when we made this proposal, it was done in the context of a, uh, a larger discussion about solid waste management, and it was kind of an afterthought, just a kind of a forward thought. And to my surprise, members of the Finance Committee embraced the concept. Uh, as luck would have it, by coincidence perhaps, uh, within a week or ten days of that meeting, I had to propose a budget, and they encouraged me to include it, which I did. Um, it's since been workshop with the full council, although the, though the council's not taken a vote, the strong consensus was to shelve that idea, study recycling further, kind of exert our energies in outreach and education. Um, so work will continue in terms of plugging those holes uh, created by removal of that program. Uh, and I think some significant progress was made today by finding another $125,000 in revenue. Tom, I've been getting a bunch of uh, questions around pay as you throw. One of them says uh, it seemed like a policy decision, but I think you've answered where it came from, where, what the genesis of it all, of where that came from. Um, if, Kevin, Kevin, can I just add one? Yes, Sean. I, just to kind of close off the sentence or close off the, the thought around pay as you throw, um, while it has been removed from the budget process, it is still a conversation for the council. Um, and it's not just the pay as you throw, it's really about solid waste management. It's the impact of EcoMaine and the cost of solid waste as well as future costs relating to the landfill closure. Um, and I believe, I speak for the council in, in that we are going to be um, submitting a resolution to create um, either an ad hoc committee to address that issue and to do the research or it will be forwarded to the energy committee that will do the research and then make a recommendation around the entire issue of uh, solid waste management and recycling. Okay, and I, I think that kind of answers the, yeah. all the questions around pay as you throw. Is so. that it will be, <laughs> it will be uh, considered again and, and more fully explored at a later date. Um, Susan Hamill has a question: um, Have salary increases outpaced the private sector in the last three years? Are such increases reasonable? given the increases in health and dental benefits? I'll, I'll take that. Um, I, I really, I'll, I'll leave it to others to determine whether the reasonable, what I'll do is report what the salary increases have been for our three classifications of employees. We have, of course, a non-union section. Um, the average three-year uh, COLA increase for non-union is 1.96%. Uh, uh, the police department, one of our bargaining units, the average three-year um, increase is 1.8 percent. For the dispatch unit, the average three-year is 2.5 percent, and for fire paramedics, it's 2.3 percent. So if you add that all up, all of those employee groups, it's a 2.14 percent increase over the three-year period. I'll leave it to you to, as to whether that's reasonable, and I'm, I don't have the data to have any opinion as to how it compares to the private sector. It, uh, while we're on that, Susan Hamill's also uh, asking uh, how much of an employee's health and dental benefits are paid by the employee? Can you provide information on the actual plans that the town provides? Well, it gets a bit complicated. I'll, I'll do my best to try to provide it in an understandable format. First, the, the town participates in the main municipal health insurance trust. So it's a collection of municipalities or quasi-municipal organizations that all pool our resources and, and have created a health trust. Uh, uh, we choose to participate in three different plan types, and there are four different categories of employees. You have single coverage, employee with spouse, employee with child, and family coverage. As you may expect, those premiums vary depending on the number uh, covered. And so, uh, certainly not trying to be evasive, but the percentages of employee coverage uh, do vary depending on uh, the coverage that's desired and, and received. For instance, for single coverage, the town pays 100% of that cost. Uh, but for family coverage, it's 72% of that cost for the predominant plan that's in place. Uh, and for del dental benefits, um, let me just refer to this, make sure I don't misstate this. Uh, the town pays 50% of the premium for individual coverage. Employees who want spouse or dependent coverage pay the entire cost uh, for that. Um, incidentally, and I, perhaps you'll address this, we'll be providing written um, responses to all these questions, and so I'll provide all the details uh, on this issue. It's, I think, a better way to convey 
uh, a lot of different numbers uh, and certainly pleased to follow up if there are further questions. I, I think that that's a good point, Tom, and, and, and uh, I, I did not mention it, but we, and it's too bad for the people whose questions that we don't get a chance to ask. If your name's not on it and you don't have uh, a way for us to contact you, you know, it, it's going to be a lot harder to answer that question for you directly. Also, hey, this is a public process. I mean, we have a right to see everything as citizens, and if, if you if you ask a question, it may take a little time to get that answer. But as citizens of Scarborough, we get an answer. It's our right. It's one of the great things of living in America. Um, <clears throat> I'll get off my bandwagon about that. Um, Tom, how many town employees had actual 2014 W-2 earnings of $100,000 and over, including overtime and other items? That's Susan Hamill asking that question. There were a total of six employees that earned um, gross wages in excess of $100,000. Um, I believe the majority of those folks uh, uh, have overtime earnings that help push them over that, that, uh, that amount. Why does the town make $80,000 in donations to charitable organizations? Again, a question from Susan Hamill. Um, so I'll, I'll take, take the shot at that one. Um, one of the uh, changes that's happened um, over time is, um, has been how we handle these uh, charitable requests or uh, organizations that are asking for requests. The current process entails really an application process in which the nonprofit um, can submit, a, um, um, submit the application explaining um, what services um, they are providing to Scarborough citizens and what the impact of their request um, will have for their organization. Um, that process is then um, really given to the town manager um, and um, given to the council uh, to review. Um, currently in this particular budget cycle, the town manager had narrowed that down because we have decided at the finance committee level to forward on to the full council a request that our rules and policies committee really formulate a formal process and a formal definition of what we want to provide for these charitable organizations. Um, currently in the budget, um, last year was $80,000 approximately. This year it's 14700 and the organizations that um, are currently targeted are Project Grace, um, the Scarborough Land Trust, and there was a small amount for another organization that was only $700. So we've narrowed it down to those three essentials. And then the council, or hopefully the Rules and Policy Committee, will come up with a more formal uh, policy around that. But right now, that has been deleted or uh, been uh, reduced down to that level. A question from our audience. How much of the increase in calls to the Scarborough Fire Department are associated with increased fireworks in high-density residential areas? That question came this evening, so we've not prepared. Chief Thurlow is here. I'm not sure, Chief, could you hazard a guess at that? Uh, would you just take the podium? It may be better to ask where the increase in calls to the fire department generally come from. The calls for service are... are a lot of them are driven by the emergency medical services. That's two-thirds of what we do. Uh, in terms of the specific questions about response to fireworks, I would say that number would be extremely small. Uh, we do go a few, and the police certainly deal with a number of fireworks complaints, but the, the actual number of responses to fireworks has not increased dramatically at all. Thanks, Mike. Is there an update on building an ice rink in Scarborough? My family recently moved to Scarborough from Connecticut and would love to get our boy and girl involved in youth hockey. That came from Michael Formas, who's a new citizen in town. Uh, sure, I'll tell you what I know. It's been several months since I've had direct con conversations with the folks from uh, the Friends of Scarborough Hockey. Uh, the town was approached uh, sometime last summer, as I recall, by a group of well-meaning uh, local residents interested in partnering with the town uh, to build a uh, hockey arena with private funds and the town uh, I think was supportive of their uh, interest in their efforts and we came to some basic understandings of a possible location on town property. Uh, this group is now, as I understand it, undergoing a, a detailed analysis of their fundraising capacity and capabilities and that's really something we encourage them to do uh, before we take the next step. Um, so I believe they've hired actually a consultant to help them understand 
the capacity to raise the sort of funds that they think they need to accomplish this. Um, but the town remains, I think, interested in, in being as helpful as we can. Okay, one final question on the municipal budget, then we'll move back over to the school budget side of things. Uh, Steve Hanley asks, if all the capital items, project and equipment, included in the budget are approved, what would be the approximate increase in debt service related to those items in fiscal year 2017? Well, there's a number of assumptions, but assuming, as the questioner asks, uh, uh, everything is approved as proposed, that would be about a little over $4 million in new debt that we would incur. Um, one, of the, uh, well, one of the exercises we always go through when we look to finance projects is understand each and every one of them, their life expectancy, and as a uh, general rule, uh, as an absolute rule, I should say, we never finance something for longer than its useful life. Uh, as luck would have it, I suppose, as you look at this uh, list of capital projects proposed for next year, there's a number of things that don't have long duration, if you will. And what that means from a debt service point of view is that we're paying, uh, you know, if we finance something over three years, you're paying heavy, heavy principal uh, to, to accomplish that. And some of the items are fairly high dollar value. Uh, the one-to-one -one computing is one of the examples. Uh, we're looking to finance that over a three-year period. That's a sizable investment. Uh, the principal alone is a big number just to buy that down in a short period of time. So the projected um, debt service requirements uh, to support these programs in FY16 would be about $470,000 in next year's budget. Excuse me, in the FY17 following year budget. Okay, thank you, Tom. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move over to the school budget side of things. A lot of questions about laptops. Um, let's start off with one from, uh, it, it's a combination of Steve Hanley and uh, Betsy Gleistein. Um, the approximate cost in fiscal year 2016 of introducing one-to-one -one computing to the high school is about one million dollars or one thousand per student. How does the cost of our proposed one-to-one -one program at the high school compare to that of other districts? Why are 1,300 PCs proposed as the number to purchase for 1,000 high school students? I would say uh, the town is very fortunate to have um, as the sh shared services uh, director of IT, uh, Jen Lim, and she is going to address that. So there's a lot of information about this, and I think there's been a lot of misinformation that's been spread. So one of the points that I want to make now is that um, there's a proposal. It's a fairly um, thorough proposal. It is listed out on the website, the school website, um, and it's actually under the one-to-one -one proposal. So it's down at the bottom on the left-hand side. Um, I think one thing that everybody needs to understand is when they say it's $1,000 per student, I just want to emphasize that that $1,000 actually includes $459 for the cost of the device, but it also rolls in a number of other things. And included in that is software, security, um, the device management application, bags, keyboard covers, a lot of different things. So I don't want to scare people off with the it's $1,000 per device. It's not $1,000 per device. It's really sort of $1,000 per student. Many of those components, for example, the software, will roll into the next device when we get it. So really the initial upfront cost is $1,000 per student. Um, why are we purchasing, uh, what was it? Uh, 1,300. 1,300. We actually have ratcheted that number down to 1,200, but we do have 1,000 students. Keep in mind that when we created this proposal, it, was, it started about two years ago. So when we started to put this proposal together, we really did not know how many students we were going to have in the high school. So we sort of had to make an educated guess. So we guessed maybe 1,100 students. Um, we also have to provide the same devices for all of the staff. So that would be the teachers, the administrative staff, um, ed techs. So roughly 120, 150 of those folks. And then we need another um, maybe 10% in what we call hot swaps. 
So hot swap devices are when a student's device actually fails or um, you know quits working for some reason. We do have uh, devices on hand that are ready to go, and we can swap those out so that they don't lose time without a device. Um, so that, with that, we come up to about 12, 12.50, so we have taken that number down. Can I, is that the whole question? Yes. Okay, another one related to that. Was it discussed or proposed to negotiate a purchase and or lease program for the laptops with service contracts and budgeting only for subsidies to students based on need with the option to provide your own laptop instead of purchasing and leasing one through the school? Okay, so I'm going to sort of split that into two pieces. Um, we did look into leasing devices, so I'm going to address that first. When we looked into leasing devices, and this sort of relates to another question that came up, which is um, how do we compare to other school districts? It's very difficult to compare ourselves to any of our peer districts because those districts, um, many of them are actually leasing through the state MLTI program. The MLTI program is the Main Learning Technology Initiative program. Any of you who have had or have kids in 6th, 7th, or 8th grade in the middle school know that they are provided with a laptop from the state of Maine. We actually just facilitate that, we clean them up, we image them, um, but the state of Maine actually owns them. You can also lease devices for other grades through the state and through that program. So we did price that out, obviously. You know, would that be a more cost-effective program? So we looked at, we have HP 440 and HP 4440 laptops in the middle school and in Wentworth. And we thought, well, maybe we should stay consistent. So we looked at pricing that out. When we looked at a four, because you have to do a four-year four lease with the state. So when we looked at doing a four-year lease, it was going to be over the four-year period almost a half a million dollars more than it would be to actually purchase the devices. And at the end of the four years, if we leased, we wouldn't own the devices. So it just didn't financially make sense for us to lease. So yes, we did look at leasing um, different devices. The second part of that question I think relates to would we just lease something or provide something on a needs basis and then have other kids bring their own device? So that kind of gets into the BYOD, the bring your own device question. And this is actually one of the questions that's answered in the proposal that's online. Um, but in looking at a BYOD program, there are kind of three major issues that we had with it. Um, and we initially thought maybe that would be the way to go. But one of the problems is really connectivity. If you're a teacher and you're in a classroom and even two of your kids out of 20 can't connect, you can't start your class. So now you have a problem because you've got to call techs. We've got to get them online. Your curriculum is no good until we can get them online. And it could be 20 minutes, it could be an hour. Um, second part of that is really the software piece of it. That's probably one of the most important parts for us in Scarborough because we own a significant amount of software, special ed software, science software, um, math software, that works with the devices that we have now, which are Windows PC based. If we were to try to go with a bring your own device model, we can't be guaranteed that all of those kids are going to be able to load the software to their device and then use it effectively to meet the curriculum standards that the teacher was setting in the classroom. So we did look to address that. We looked at what's called a VDI, which is a virtual desktop interface. That actually provides a virtual desktop behind the scenes. So if you think about if you're logging on to any website, it would be like a typical URL, you would log in and you would actually log into the school systems and you would be able to pull up the applications that we have loaded there. That system is for 250 seats, roughly $350,000. And we would definitely have to have more than 250 concurrent seats. So we opted not to go that route. Um, and then the third piece, connectivity, <coughs> software, and then the third piece is um, basic accessibility for all kids to have a device. If you think in Scarborough, we have roughly a 14% free and reduced rate. And then if you think those, there's probably another 5% of folks who are kind of on the edge, we would still have to provide devices for 20% of the kids. And then you have hot swaps. And so you're, you're still having to purchase devices and maintain them and manage them. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> K 
Ken Simons in our audience asks, is there any evidence to support improved educational outcomes, i.e. test scores, with one-to-one -one technology? There is. I probably should let Monique speak more to this. Um, we have actually listed in that proposal that I mentioned, in the back in the appendix, there is a report, um, a national study that was done, that does actually show you metrically um, what the outcomes were when they went out and polled, I don't know how many different school districts. But they did find that indeed, one-to-one -one programs, and I have to stress this part, that are implemented properly definitely lead to better learning outcomes, increased test scores, et cetera. Did I capture that? <laughs> okay, one uh, <clears throat> last question on uh, the one-to-one -one computing from Tim Willett. Has the school department consider considered holding off on the one-to-one -one computing and focusing on improving the student schedule in the coming years? I'm, I'm going to take that, Jen. I'll, I'll let you take a rest for a minute. Um, these are two initiatives, uh, the schedule at the high school and the one-to-one -one initiative are two things that are not mutually exclusive. Um, the change to what is really a, an antiquated school, high school uh, schedule uh, will happen in the school year 2016-2017, uh, uh, and work has been ongoing um, on exploration of a new schedule um, uh, last year and will continue through um, this, this current year and will continue through next year. Um, that's a, the structural piece is really an organizational, um, uh, an organizational change. It's a change in a structure um, versus the investment in technology is, is really building the capacity for our more than 1,000 students um, to have the essential uh, tools uh, that they need in order to be successful in the future. Um, as J uh, Jen said, um, there's a, a good bit of misunderstanding out there about this proposed investment. Of 24 high schools here in southern Maine, Scarborough unfortunately is one of three schools that's not providing one-to-one -one technology. Uh, the, pro the proposal that we have, and it is all online, it's a very well done proposal, it's easy, it's an easy read, uh, it's, I don't know, 40 pages or so, but it's a, it's a bit of an easy read. Um, the proposal uh, for building this capacity at Scarborough High School uh, has been uh, a work in progress for the last two years. There was, uh, admittedly, um, a, an unsuccessful pro proposal that had been brought about five years ago, um, and it failed uh, because um, I, from what I understand, the high school was really not ready to embrace technology um, as an essential tool for 21st century learning. Right now, the students and staff at Scarborough High School are fully poised not only to embrace the new technology, but to fully utilize it. Um, and so that investment that the community make, would make in laptops uh, would move our learning to new and different and, and higher levels for our students in, in grades 9 through 12. I think um, there, there's clear research, as Jen said, that, that, that uh, suggests that, that technology, properly used, um, will advance uh, student learning. It also creates opportunities for blended learning, which is a combination of in-class and out-of-class um, uh, learning for our students, which can open tremendous doors in terms of, um, of new opportunities uh, that we don't currently offer and we're not able to offer at the, um, at the high school right now. Uh, again, um, there's a number of examples of how uh, this investment in technology at the high school uh, will change uh, teaching and learning there. You can find all of that um, in the proposal. Um, thank you, George. <clears throat> will you be asking taxpayers to provide broadband to all students at their houses since the internet is also needed for school work? If so, when? If not, why not? Uh, we sure. will not be asking, um, or we will not be having families ask us to provide broadband. There used to be, I think that question probably stems from um, an old caveat in the MLTI program, which they discontinued, I believe, two years ago, um, where 
needs-based families could petition the state to ask for the state to provide broadband for them through the MLTI program. They've discontinued that. That's not something that we would really be able to do. Um, but that's part of the reason why I know that there's been questions about why did we choose sort of a full-fledged laptop as opposed to a Chromebook. We did look at the Chromebooks, but part of the reason why we opted to go with the full-fledged laptop is because the Chromebooks, they are simply a portal to the Internet. You cannot load anything to program software, anything to a Chromebook. So students who did not have access to the Internet at any particular time Wi-Fi um, would not actually be able to continue with their studies. With a full-fledged laptop, we intend on, we've budgeted for loading specific software like uh, Microsoft Word, Excel, um, you know, other software that they use at the high school so that students can continue with their studies and do their homework offline. And then when they get into a place where they have Wi-Fi access, they can load their work up to wherever it needs to be. Okay, thank you. Is it true that the Kiwanis Club donated over 200 backpacks and supplies to school children last year because parents could not afford them? That's a question from our audience. Well, well, um, I don't mind taking that one since I, I also am a volunteer with Project Grace and I'm familiar with uh, Kiwanis. Kiwanis has been incredibly supportive in our efforts to do backpacks uh, for children in Scarborough. They did a lot. I don't believe you did 200, right, Jackie? No. So um, it's really an effort that is put forth typically by Project Grace and lots of organizations, lots of civic groups, lots of individual people in Scarborough contribute to that effort. And so, no, they didn't do 200. But did we have a lot of kids get backpacks? Yes, but not 200, no. Thank you, Donna. Um, I did want to note uh, that on the laptop questions in the way that they were answered seem to uh, answer some of the questions that were posed by uh, Tom Heels, Elaine Richer, uh, Betsy Gleistein. So I think we've covered pretty much everything that, that was asked. Um, in, uh, Steve Hanley has a question. In August 2014, about $23,000 had been raised towards the cost of the $40,000 hanging glass sculpture at the new Wentworth School. As a result, taxpayers were still responsible for $17,000 of the cost. How much has been raised for the sculpture as of April 23rd, 2015? It's a number question, so it must be mine. Right? Uh, <laughs> the, the current fundraising balance for the art project at Wentworth, and I don't know if any, all of you have seen that, but it's, it's a pretty magnificent thing in the, in the front foyer, uh, sculpture representing the marsh. Uh, that's, it's pretty amazing. Current fundraising balance is $24,235. We do have additional brick sales ongoing. That's expected to be a continuing process. Uh, there was a budget amount approved in the Wentworth Building Project budget uh, for the art installation. It was $50,000. And the idea was that uh, whatever we could um, create in fundraising could offset that cost and save money on the project budget. So what we're looking at then would be a net cost of the installation to the project budget of $15,765, which means that you have a savings of the original budget. And um, I think somewhere in the various presentations you may have seen, we are using the balance of the bonded unused funds for the Wentworth project to offset desk service costs in the fiscal year 16 proposed budget. Um, I did have one other note as I was taking a look at that question about art in schools. Um, kind of a side note and I don't want to take too much time about it, but there, there's a state statute and there are some uh, instructions and, and requirements from the Department of Education when a school receives state funds for building a school. Um, obviously we didn't receive any state funds and the school was built uh, thanks to the generosity of the taxpayers of Scarborough. But there, there is a provision that uh, about 1% of your budget should be devoted to public art because they're considered public buildings and uh, there's a movement on the part of the, the, the legislature uh, to bring art to the people. 
obviously $50,000 is not 1% of our Wentworth budget. That would have been more like $390,000. But we did sort of honor the intent of uh, that school construction requirement um, by putting in our own, uh, our, our own approach to uh, public art and doing it at, I think, a, a very reasonable cost. Thank you. And one last question before we go over to the municipal side. Does the school have surplus space, asks Tom Heels. Uh, I'll take that. The uh, short answer to that is no. Um, the, uh, we have in, engaged in a, a very comprehensive um, uh, facilities uh, study. Uh, it's the first time in quite a bit of time, I think, that the schools have really done anything quite this extensive. Uh, the bottom line is that there is some excess space in some places, and we have overcrowding in, in other places. Um, if you put them together, you essentially have no excess space. Um, there is a long-term facilities committee that has been working. Um, right now, we have um, uh, some significant work being done on the demographics. Uh, Scarborough is a tough place to really project what the school population is going to be looking like. Um, we get numbers that say that things will stay low, and yet we see a tremendous amount of development happening um, in and around town. So um, we're really vetting uh, the numbers that we have and getting some good projections going out. We'll use that to then evaluate um, three or four options uh, that have been uh, developed that came out of the the, the comprehensive study that we've done. And our goal is basically to fully utilize um, very efficiently and programmatically effectively um, for all of our students the, the space that we have within our facilities and do that in a way that will be uh, cost effective. Thank you, George. Mm -hmm. Let's move over to the municipal side now. <clears throat> uh, this is a question from Jackie Perry, a member of the school board. Um, in an article in the local paper, Bruce Gulliver of Community Services states that because of the increased revenues, the town budget for community services has decreased. How much would it increase if community services paid the school department for facilities use at the same rate that it charges groups? I'll take that. Um, I think I partially answered this question before. We have uh, committed to undertake a detailed analysis so we better understand the shared services model and, and how we, uh, what the allocations are. Um, it strikes me, and this is my working theory, we'll, we'll see if I'm right, that probably the school makes out better than the town in, in the current relationship. But I guess what's most important to me is that the taxpayer benefits, is that we, we do uh, you know, if, if we didn't have the right to use the fields and indoor facilities that the school has, uh, we would have to either build them ourselves or find other places to provide our programs. Um, for anyone that's been in any one of our school buildings, these places are used uh, very, very heavily. Um, you know, most nights I'm sure both gyms are taken in this, in this facility and we as taxpayers ought to be proud of the fact that we're maximizing community assets. So, um, again, we, we, we have committed to understanding that better, and I think come this time next year, uh, I would like to make sure that the budgets reflect as accurate of costs as, as are possible. And I, I should have mentioned, I suppose, at the outset, uh, the way the basic shared services model works is that uh, community services staff does all the scheduling, facility scheduling, that's indoor and outdoor, fields and courts. Um, Revenue that comes from that, with the exception of the turf field, is revenue of the school. And, and I believe that's about a $40,000 revenue uh, on an annual basis. The turf is a little different in that we put those monies into a reserve account for purposes of replacement of that turf when that time is necessary. Um, we're about eight years into that and hope to get about 15 total years out of the turf facility before we have to replace it. And our intent is to have enough money put away to pay for that when the time comes. Um, in exchange for our use of fields and facilities, we take care of them. And it is in that um, relationship that we're going to study it further and, and better understand 
um, where those costs really should be borne. And again, it's my hope to make sure next year's budget reflects as accurate uh, an allocation as possible. Thank you, Tom. <clears throat> why does the beach revenue, why does the beach revenue get credited to community services? Question from Susan Hamill. Sure. It's got to go somewhere. Um, generally speaking, you know, we like to uh, credit revenue where expenses are captured. And community services, by far, although other departments have involvement in beach activities, community services uh, captures the majority of costs related to managing those facilities. Uh, though Public Works does the beach cleaning once a week, they, uh, they're actually paid for uh, by community services. Um, police department certainly provides some seasonal attention to the beach areas. Um, but really, that's the answer. We, we show it in community service because that's the department that expends the most to manage that resource. Susan Hamill has another question. Why not sell the building at 29 Black Point Road rather than pay ongoing maintenance and forego tax revenue? We, we certainly could do that. Um, on at least a monthly basis, I hear from residents lamenting the fact that we sold the Dunstan School. Um, that was decades ago, frankly, um, I, and uh, I suspect that reaction from the community influenced the, the town's decision at the time uh, when the Oak Hill building was, was vacated. Right now, we're getting about 54000 almost $55,000 in annual lease revenue uh, to support its, uh, its upkeep, and it still looks intact, uh, kind of uh, in, in a... Right now, that seems to be working, but that's an option the town could consider um, really at any time after we talk to the current tenant. Susan Hamill asks, how did the proposed new public safety building go from $13.5 million in last year's budget to $18 million now? Yeah, the, the new public safety building is uh, in our five-year capital plan. Uh, it's still several years out, so I must admit that that number is not been perfected by an architect or an engineer. It is a, a best guess. And that's not all that uncommon for the out years of a five-year plan. As it gets closer, we get those numbers more accurate. Um, I think that's a, a fairly, though rough, but still somewhat accurate project. Uh, projection of what a combined police and fire facility would cost. Um, should this process move forward, I fully would expect there would be a building committee that would further understand what the components of that building are and the sort of amenities that it would, it would house, all of which would have an effect on the ultimate cost. So I wouldn't be overly concerned with this number. Uh, it's a placeholder um, and, and will be perfected as we get closer. Okay, um, got some questions here uh, relating to the, uh, the CPI, and uh, I'm going to start with Sean Babine said that the goal is a stable tax rate that we can all live with. Do you consider a 7.3% increase to be a stable tax rate? Uh, there are also questions around uh, the mill rate of approximately 7% does not reflect the CPI figure of 1.7%. Sean, if you could talk mill rates and uh, the tax rate. Sure. Um, no, I don't believe 7.12% is reasonable at this particular time. But the question is, as we're looking at that, is um, what are we willing to forego and to pass by? Um, you know, education is taking a hit from the state because um, we have a Republican governor who is decreasing um, local municipal funding in many areas. We have to share that burden, and we can't let our school system deteriorate as a result of that. Um, if we continue um, not hiring new employees to, to take care of us and our public safety, um, we have a further deterioration of our community. And the fact is that all of our homes are impacted positively by the growth of this community, by the actions that have been taken by this council and past councils, and we're going to continue making reasonable and rational assessments around that. What is the magic number? I don't know because the people I hope will be able to share what they think is reasonable. Um, I've heard everything from a 2% um, tax increase, which doesn't match to the 1.74. And we've been arguing for years about which metrics do we really want to use to be able to measure the quality of our community. Um, I remember 
15 years ago, council members were arguing about, is it CPI, is it PPI, which is the producer index. I mean, every person has a different understanding of what the cost of living and what the cost of services are. And the fact is that most of those metrics actually don't even measure the real value of what we're providing in this community. You can't use CPI to measure the value of an education. Um, one of the best quotes I heard at a council meeting was, we, can, we know what the cost of sand and salt is. We don't know what the cost of teaching our kids math um, truly is. And you can't measure that. Um, and so we have to make the best, the best judgments and the best assessment. Is 7% high this year? Yeah, I do believe that. I think there is a consensus on the council that it probably is. But there's a lot of discussion ahead about where we're going to come up with that gap between what is reasonable and what we currently have on the table. I could just add one comment, and perhaps I, I shouldn't, but it, it's a process that I know the superintendent and his staff has, have started to understand. I really congratulate them for spending time. But uh, there's a lot been made through this whole conversation about uh, uh, CPI and whether that's a relevant and reasonable standard to compare ourselves to. And I believe there's a theory, there, there's something to public institutions, particularly educational institutions, that have 75% uh, of their budget, which are wage and salary, uh, salary and benefit related. Uh, those sorts of organizations, the cost of running those organizations, I don't believe, uh, compare very well to the CPI figures. Um, the superintendent referred to a 20-year analysis that we've begun that we need to understand better, but the initial results show that uh, annual growth of those kinds of organizations are between 4 and 5%. And it's really as a function of how they're made up and what their cost structures are. Are there ways to reduce those? Sure, but I'm just, I, we want to understand this better, but I think it's a point worth making. We should be held to a standard, but let's make sure we're holding ourselves to the correct standard. Mm -hmm. And that's something we need to understand better and, and we'll work toward. One final question on the municipal side. Um, why doesn't the town give incentive to builders to build more 55 and over neighborhoods like the two we already have? They are in high demand, they would bring a lot more tax dollars, and would, and would not add more children to the schools. Not that I don't love children, because of course I do. <laughs> Asked by Paula O'Brien. Well, we don't have any formal programs on the books, but I can tell you the three, well, two existing and one proposed uh, 55 plus uh, projects in town have received fairly substantial support from the town. Uh, Bessie Commons, the old high school across from town hall, uh, it, it was town property. There's a 99 year lease. Beyond that, there's a TIF that helps support that operation. Uh, more recently, just last year, uh, the current council approved uh, uh, another senior housing project in the Dunstan area off Griffin Road. That's yet to be built, but that's another example of how the town can help incentivize. And most recently, in fact, next week at the council meeting, uh, there's a request from Avesta Housing uh, for a contract zone down in, the, again, the Dunson area, the old Southgate uh, house, uh, to build a, affordable, and I believe there's some 55-plus aspects to that house. So all of those are examples of how uh, we can help advance those kinds of projects in town. Thanks, Tom. Let's move back over to the school budget side of things. We've got about 12 minutes remaining. George, what spending has been cut from the school budget in response to the $1.3 million loss in revenues? I, in terms of looking at the state subsidy, the adjustments that we've had there is, um, as uh, Chris said, uh, is just a 21% uh, or more than 21% reduction this year. It has been a pattern. It's upwards of 60% over the last four or five years. Um, it is, it has not been my response or my team's response to correspondingly reduce um, what in fact has been reduced from us as uh, uh, the state subsidy. It's just, that's, it's not plausible. I think that, you know, I. Uh, thank Tom for his comments, um, nor, nor is it uh, uh, plausible to think that the consumer price index uh, could be an indicator of uh, what uh, is happening in terms of school spending. It's just, it's just not going to, it doesn't work. Um, and I have looked at it, as Tom said, I mentioned earlier, I've done a 20-year 20, 20 um, analysis. I've looked at what has happened 
uh, in Scarborough. I've looked at what has happened in terms of state average spending. I've looked at, so that's all of these towns in Maine. I've looked at our cohort district districts, um, which are sort of on the, the high end, and then moved and looked at um, national cohorts and done comparisons. And, and Tom's right. There's, there's nothing that would indicate something that would be any less than between four and five plus percent adjustments when you're running a human service um, organization where really we provide education, but it's really a multi-service organization um, that uh, where 70, over 75 percent of our costs are um, professionals and staff that service over 30 through 3,100 kids. Um, we, I cannot um, mo um, mothball uh, equipment. I cannot um, give um, um, uh, you know uh, furlough days and say, okay, 3,100 kids do not show up for the next two weeks. We're going to save money. It's it's um it, that's not the way we look at it. We have been uh, responsibly and respectfully uh, looking in terms of the spending piece, looking at how to. Um, how to use the resources that we have allocated to us to provide an excellent organ, uh, uh, experience and uh, prepare these 3,100 kids um, for the future. And I think we're doing a darn good job. And it's at, in some ways, bargain basement prices right now. And I think the problem and the concern is that um, some of the quality is consistent with bar the bargain. And I'm not sure that that serves our kids well. So we have been looking at how to build this rebuild, rebuild this school district in a positive, rational, incremental, predictable way that is going to put the, the, these 3,100 kids um, uh, on a good path and, and place them as being competitive uh, with the other kids. They're not just competing with kids from Madison, Maine. They're com competing with kids from all over the world. And, um, and we've got to take a different way of looking at um, how we, um, either as a community, um, accept the responsibility that the valuation in the community has driven a reduction in what the state is offering us, step up to that, um, or uh, decide differently. But I'm hoping that uh, we're going to decide to step up to it and recognize that um, what's, what's driving the changes in terms of the reduced subsidy is uh, increased valuation here, uh, which is good for anybody who owns property here. So I've, I've, I've not approached it in that way. Thank you. <clears throat> How did energy costs increase due to the severity of last winter? What's the energy plan this year? Did the Wentworth School do well with its energy costs? Um, as far as Wentworth is concerned, we really don't have a complete year to base our um, understanding on yet. We have some projections from the uh, architects and the designers and engineers that, that put the plans together. Um, just anecdotally, I think we've done pretty well with the geothermal system, but you know that's a real off-the-cuff kind of crazy thing to say that George should be kicking me right now. Um, I, I feel as though it's it's a neat model, and I, I think it's going to prove to be a really good one for us. Um, there's an offsetting cost, and I'm, I'm not a, an engineer, so forgive me, but there's an offsetting cost of more electricity used because of running the heat pumps and the systems, and uh, less or virtually no natural gas used, which was our heating source in, in the old building and in our middle school and high school. So it, it, it's been an interesting experiment. I think it's going to prove to be a good savings for us. I'm not sure I'm really answering the whole question, though, Kevin. It was more about how are we doing on energy costs from, from the, the tough winter? Yes. And I would say that uh, we're, we're maxing out a little bit on, on the natural gas, on the heating, because it's been so cold and, and the ice and snow. The other place where we've had some expenditures that were a little bit unexpected, and I, I know Mike will will uh, share this with me. Is just you know an absolute ton of ice melt, and uh, a little bit more than we expected to spend money on trying to keep those sidewalks and and uh, uh, parking areas clean. But um, I don't consider it to be uh, budget 
concern. I don't think we're going to have an overrun that's going to be um, difficult to manage by the end of the year. That question was asked by Anita DiCecchio. I believe I'm pronouncing it correctly. She also asked a question, <clears throat> will the state be funding charter schools, relieving local school systems of that cost? Can I take that one too? Yes. Um, I don't know. I'd love it if they did. Um, I think uh, Chris may have mentioned early on that the charter schools is one of the drivers in our uh, budget increase. And um, the difficulty with charter school funding for Scarborough is that although there is a, a subsidy offset from the state, um, as we've heard, the bulk of our um, the bulk of our revenues comes from our town, not from the state. So for every dollar that we send away to a charter school, we get maybe 11, 12, 13 cents from the state to pay us back for that. Um, and uh, it's, it's a difficult model for us to sustain. You know, we, we've got a handful of folks that are taking advantage of the charter schools. The charter schools are awesome for some kids. Um, they're providing great opportunities uh, for kids who need a different model of education. Uh, but the funding piece is very difficult to manage. The um, population goes up and down, the enrollment changes, and uh, it's difficult to predict, uh, and it is a bit of a burden. So to answer the question, I don't know whether we will be relieved of that burden. I would like it if we were. Um, in this year's budget, we have $269,000 in the, the fiscal 16 proposal to cover the cost of what we think charter schools will cost us. Um, if I could take that out of the budget, that would be really great. In uh, fiscal year 2014, the school lunch program lost about $280,000. In fiscal year 2016, it is expected to lose about $175,000. Yet the budgeted loss in the fiscal year 2016 budget is only $75,000. Why is the school lunch program losing so much each year, and why does the fiscal year 2016 budget understate the expected loss by $100,000? I'm going to ask Kate to uh, explain that. It's a big question, and it, it has a long answer, um, so I'll try to be brief, and I, I can address it also. I think we talked about having a written format so that we can, we can follow up in more detail. Um, the school nutrition program uh, has a lot of factors that impact its ability to earn money. We have it set up as what's called an enterprise fund, which is um, it means that their expenditures are supposed to be offset by their revenues, um, and in recent years, the USDA, which manages the free and reduced lunch program, has created more and more and more restrictions on what school lunch programs can do in order to belong to that program. Um, there are prescriptions about how much food is uh, prepared and served to kids. There are prescriptions about the types of food. Um, there are prescriptions on the amount of uh, uh, fees that we can charge for those meals. Um, and the amount of offsetting subsidy that we might get from the feds to pay for them. Um, the result of those restrictions, combined with the downturn in the economy in the past few years, has meant that our revenues have basically gone down and our expenditures have gone up. And so as a result, um, as the questioner mentions, we are covering a deficit in the school lunch program at the end of, of any year. Um, that's happened for the past five years, and it's grown a little bit each year. Um, the reason that there's $75,000 in the budget proposal in the general fund as support for school nutrition, a um, number of reasons. One is we have a great school nutrition program. It uh, does an amazing job of, of feeding our kids uh, well, and it's, got, it's won awards. Um, it, it, it's got some terrific programming in place. We want to support that. We want to feed our kids well. Um, and we know that at the end of the year, we're likely to need that money to help them out. Um, why is it not more than that? Well, traditionally, we have funded any deficit in that plan at the end of the school year uh, from the general fund, from surplus available at the end of the year. Hasn't been a budgeted amount. It was only in fiscal 13 that we first put some money into the budget specifically for that purpose. So we treated it as, um, oh, that's probably the bell, huh? We, we treated it as uh, 
as an overshort at the end of the year that needed to be reconciled. And the school board does that with a number of accounts. So any account that runs over budget by more than $10,000 is actually reconciled at the end of the year by the school, school board through a vote. There's a process in place. So we've always treated school lunch in that way, and it's only in recent years that those deficits have grown. We've said, you know, we really need to start budgeting some money for that rather than counting on making up the difference with overs and shorts. Um, that said, uh, we think the $75,000 is a pretty good placeholder. Obviously, we would like it to be a little bit more, but we have some program changes that we think are going to be coming up in the coming year that may assist us in sort of balancing out uh, those deficits. The program is well run. We've got a few ideas about how to make a few changes, and uh, we're hoping that we're going to be in good, a good position to fund that. Thank you very much. That was, in fact, the 9 o'clock bell. I, I heard it. <laughs> and, uh, I knew I'd talk over it, too. Um, we, I, I've been going through. We, we've, we've had uh, between uh, 45 questions that were submitted um, via email, another 15 to 20 that came in from you in the audience tonight, some of which were you know, redundant with um, the other questions that we received. Um, but we have answered most of those uh, through the course of this. And if we have your address, and, and on the submit, one submitted by email we do, um, the town and the school department will be uh, responding back to you with answers. Um, Tom, do we have an avenue to go down with some of these questions that were unable to be asked that were submitted tonight? So I, I think the expectation is we intend to provide written responses for all questions, those submitted by email and those that came in this evening. Um, my thought was to uh, provide kind of a, a question and answer format uh, just as they come, and we can certainly get back to individual questioners if that's uh, what they'd prefer. But my thought is to make them up uh, and available on our, both of our websites so everyone could see uh, the questions asked and the answers provided. Well, I thank you all for, for coming this evening. Uh, it's been a very good process. And thank you to our, uh, our town council, our uh, school board members, our school department and town department officials. Tom, thank you. And uh, thanks again to Karen Martin and Bruce Gulliver, who were uh, running the questions up to me. It's time to go home. Thanks. Good night. <laughs>